Those disaster movies, like when the Earth's going to be destroyed. Teresa. Teresa loves them. Yeah. You know, it's destroyed by a comet or a meteor or something like this or some kind of cataclysmic event, right? Yeah. So usually somewhere in the movie, the president of the movie will make a speech saying something like, things are continuous as they always have. You'll go to work, you'll pay your bills, there'll be no looting or riots, and if they are, they'll be dealt with quickly and harshly. And then what happens? In the very next scene of the movie, what do you see? Looting, looting and rioting, right? That's kind of like what I read in this final chapter in uh, 2 Thessalonians uh, this morning. Uh, Paul had written to them previously about the rapture and the second coming and how they should encourage one another with these things. But some in the church in Thessalonica had maybe you know, twisted or misused Paul's words and maybe had focused too much on the things going on around them, like the state of things in their world, instead of focusing on Jesus. But Paul also tells us in this last chapter in 2 Thessalonians that just like the president says in those disaster movies, unruly behavior in the church will need to be dealt with quickly and harshly for the benefit of those in the church and for the benefit of the one who may be walking in a disorderly manner, as Paul puts it in verse 11 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. So we're going to look at all that today, so let's pray before we get into God's word. Father God, we thank you, Father. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you, Father, for how the Apostle Paul was... Uh, was, was uh, diligent, Lord, to, uh, to uh, write these words inspired by the Holy Spirit, Lord, to share them with that church in, in Thessalonica, Lord, to share them with the churches throughout the ages, Lord. So, Father, we thank you that we can read these verses this morning, Lord, and just see how you, uh, how you apply those to us, Lord, to, uh, to our lives, to our church, to us as individuals, Lord. And, Father, that your Holy Spirit would speak to each and every one of us uh, on what we may need to hear from today's message. So, Father, we thank you, and we love you, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're going to start reading with 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. We're going to read the first uh, two verses here. Paul writes, Finally, brethren, pray for us, that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. So the Apostle Paul, if you think about it, if you read a lot of his epistles, he's never hesitant to ask other Christians to pray for him or those in ministry with him. And I think that's a great example for all of us that sometimes, you know, we're on the receiving end of those prayers and sometimes we're on the giving end of those prayers. Now, in this context, Paul is asking for prayers in regard to the work he was doing in ministry or the spreading of the word of God swiftly and that would have a positive effect on those that the word was being preached to as it had done with the Thessalonians. You know, I've talked to a lot of people that have either gone in the mission field or they're involved with evangelizing and they always tell me, that without the prayers of those on the team and those praying for the team, they would not have seen God move in the mighty ways that they were able to be a part of. So prayer is important there. Praying for open ears and open hearts to the word of God and that God would provide those opportunities to spread the word. And of course, we know that God's word alone can and will accomplish great things in people's lives. Isaiah writes in Isaiah 55, 11, he writes, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. And then the second request in Paul's prayer found in verse 2 is for protection from what he calls unreasonable and wicked men, Paul calls them in this letter. Uh, if you've been on the mission field or, or out evangelizing, or, or even when you've shared the gospel with those around you, you know, many times there are those that are opposed to the gospel, those without faith, as Paul puts it. And they will frustrate your efforts or try to. Paul points out to us in the importance to pray against those distractions. And we need to remember that this is a spiritual battle. And it's not a battle with other people. It is a spiritual battle. And Paul writes about that in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. He writes, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. But even with that being said, where does our real protection come from? It comes from Jesus. It comes from the Lord himself. Paul writes, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3, But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. So the Lord is truly faithful to guard us from the evil one and his efforts to disrupt our efforts in spreading the gospel. God promises to supply all of our needs, even in the things that we need to do to keep serving him and spreading his word. In Philippians 4, verse 19, Paul writes, And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. 
And keep this in mind too, God will not allow Satan just to have free will and do what he wants to do with us. Remember when Satan wanted to sift Peter like wheat before he betrayed him, before he betrayed the Lord? Here's Jesus speaking to Peter and the apostles in Luke chapter 22, 31 to 32. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Something interesting here too, the word you in those verses in Luke is the plural form. So Jesus was not just referring to Peter, but to all the disciples. And Jesus is doing the same thing for believers today. He's guarding us from the evil one as well. So let's get back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 4 now. And Paul writes, And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. So the confidence that Paul had in the Thessalonians to do the right thing, the things that he and Silas and Timothy had commanded them to do, was not based on the confidence he had in the Thessalonians themselves, but it was the confidence he had in the Lord to help the Thessalonians and to stand true in obedience to God. You know, Paul's confidence was that since the Thessalonians were in Christ, the Lord would work in them to respond favorably to the word of God and then obey. Now, personally, I like that because on my own, I'm weak. And I will not always choose to do the right things that the word commands me to do. But with the knowledge that Jesus is in me, I am capable to do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Amen? Amen. So God, to keep this in mind too, God just doesn't pour, you know, spiritual maturity and stability into us, but he works it in us through our cooperation with his will. Let's read on 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. That's where our title came from today's message. So Paul closes this Introduction, if you will, to chapter 3 of 2 Thessalonians with these comforting and encouraging words. You know, the word direct here means to clear away. So so picture God, by his grace and love for you, kind of clearing away any obstacles that may be hindering your progress in love and in patience. He's doing that for you. He's clearing those things away. And personally, I like that too because I can tend to grow a hardened heart and lose patience with others. But God is watching out for me. He's clearing away all that junk so I can love others and I can have patience, especially maybe when I'm ridiculed or worse when sharing the gospel. But now Paul's going to get into the meat of chapter 3 in 2 Thessalonians and how we need to deal with unruly people. And not those unruly outside of the church, those that do not have faith, as he said earlier, but those in the church and how we cannot allow the things going on around us to distract us from doing good. So let's read 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. Paul writes, But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. Now you know, this is a serious command that Paul is giving the Thessalonians when he writes that this command is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not a command that Paul came up with by himself or on his own, but one that comes with the authority of Jesus. The command is to withdraw or keep away from or keep aloof from someone who walks disorderly or who leads an unruly life, which is not based on the teachings that Paul and his companions have shared with them. Christians should never withdraw from someone because he fails to conform to man's traditions or ideas, but if he fails repeatedly to the standards of God's word. Obedient Christians, or even ones that are trying to be obedient to the things of God, should not fellowship with habitually disobedient Christians. In the NIV, it translated this this, uh, disorderly walk as idleness and disruptive behavior, specifically. We're going to get into that in a moment, what he may be referring to. But let's take a look at this rather, it may seem like a harsh command at first. But this is all in love. First off, this is not allowing a believer to withdraw from another believer because he or she just doesn't like that person or or you just don't get them or, or you don't agree with maybe how that person may follow Jesus differently than you do or even if they minister to others in maybe a way you personally would not. That is a wrong application of this verse in and of itself and should be self-examined in every situation. 
Paul is stressing that this withdrawing is due to disobedience, not immaturity or a lack of understanding to the teachings of Scripture. It's disobedience to the teachings of Scripture. And the reason for this drawing is not to punish that one or to show them that they just don't fit in with Christianity, but it is to bring about repentance and restoration. The church should be such a place of comfort and love that, that, that being separated from fellowship should cause that one to be saddened, that they are excluded, and that they should obey God's commands to be restored to fellowship. You know, for a Christian, to be out of fellowship with other Christians would cause or should cause heartache and should cause a desire to have that fellowship again. You know, in this case, absence truly does make the heart grow fonder. You know, Paul dealt with a problem in the church in Corinth. It's described in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Many of you probably familiar with the story. It's about a man sleeping with his stepmother. Paul wrote in verse 5, Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. So this man was to be purposely placed outside the church into the domain of Satan in the hope that he would not only be restored in fellowship, but that he would be spiritually restored. I have some things I want to share with you that uh, someone shared with me that comes from uh, Paul Tripp. Maybe some of you are familiar with him. He's a pastor, author, speaker. And he writes this, and I think it goes with what we're talking about today. He writes, our culture, and I would also offer that the culture in the Church of Corinth, apparently, places a high premium on being tolerant and polite. We, we go as far as to convince ourselves that we're not speaking out the truth because we love the other person, when in reality, we fail to speak because we lack love. We fail to confront not because we love others too much, but because we love ourselves too much, because we don't love God enough. Perhaps we love the, the personal benefits a relationship with someone else gives us, that we don't want to risk losing that. I mean, maybe we prefer to avoid the, the hardship, sacrifice, and complications that confrontation will bring about. Perhaps a fear of man is what prevents us from confronting. You know, will they misunderstand me, get angry with me, talk badly about me to others? Maybe our hearts are, are ruled more by peace, respect, and appreciation than the love of God and love of one's neighbor. To the degree that we give the love of our hearts to someone or something else, to that degree, we also lose our primary motive to confront. Confrontation is our moral responsibility in every relationship. Lest you incur sin because of him, the NIV says. So you will not share in their guilt. So if we love people and want God's best for them, how can we stand by it as they wander away? How can we let them deceive themselves with, with excuses, with, with blame and, and, and rationalizations? How can we watch them get more and more enslaved by the fleeting pleasures of sin? How can we let a sufferer add to the suffering by the way he responds to his own experience? True love is neither idle nor timid. It is other-centered and active. It is not offensively intrusive or rude, but the Bible repudiates covering sin with silence. And it's done in love. Now in the next several verses in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, we're actually going to see what this disorderliness was going on in the church in Thessalonica. What was Paul referring to? What was he talking about specifically? So let's read on 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. Paul writes, For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. Let's go back here. So remember, excuse me, how we mentioned the NIV translated the words uh, walking disorderly as idleness and disruptive behavior in verse 6. Well, here apparently there were those in the Thessalonian church that were not working, and so it become a burden to others in the church. You know, mind you, this is not referring to those that, that could not work, maybe for physical reasons, but to those that could work, but for some reason chose not to. Paul even uses him himself and his missionary partners as examples in this that they worked 
day and night outside of their missionary work to support themselves so as not to be a burden. Now in verse 9, Paul writes that they had the authority to ask for support as ministers of the gospel, but here they chose not to. Now it is important to note that on other occasions, Paul did tell his readers to support those in ministry financially. The laborer, the one who labors for the gospel, is worthy of his wages. Is something Jesus said and Paul would say. Paul cited Barnabas and himself in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 when he wrote that if they sowed spiritual things for the church at Corinth, should they also be allowed to reap materially as others did for their work? But here in this case in Thessalonica, Paul felt led not to be any kind of financial burden on this young church. And by doing so, he set an example for hard work. And of course, we have the famous words of Paul in verse 10, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. And in verse 11, he writes that they have heard of those that do that choose not to work, and by doing so, they acted disorderly and caused disruption because their idleness led to being busybodies. They focused their efforts not on being busy to support themselves, but by being busy disrupting the church. Now, a case can be made, <clears throat> excuse me, and many commentators hold this opinion, that those that were not working here may have been doing so because of what Paul had written to them about the rapture, and so they may have felt, you know, what's the use of working when Jesus is about to come get us? It's almost like, it's almost like communism, in that if everyone shares in the same result, no matter how little or how they work, then why work at all? Let someone else do the heavy lifting. It oftentimes seems like, to me, it takes more work to avoid work than to just work. And that's not only unfair to your fellow believers, but according to Paul, it leads to bad behavior. And besides, Paul never told them when that rapture or their second coming would occur, but more importantly, he told them about that to encourage one another with those promises. It's not very encouraging to have others work to support you. That's not encouraging somebody. You know, it's kind of like you were talking about the president gives that, that uh, speech in the disaster movie to keep living your lives and going to work and don't start looting. And that these in Thessalonica, they were laying the circumstances around them, what they perceived, and bad interpretation of Paul's words to justify their bad behavior. I, I remember this. I remember when me and Teresa were, were younger, just starting our family. Maybe we had two or three kids at the time. I know that's a complete family for some, but that was just a start for us. <laughs> but many well-meaning Christians told us back then, you shouldn't have any more kids right now because the tribulation's coming. And you don't want your kids going through that. That was 30 years ago. They were letting circumstances in the world and in our society cause them to think that way. Let's read on 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. Paul writes, but as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. Now, I know that I use this verse a lot to encourage others in the work they do for the kingdom, but the context around this verse is very important. You know, Paul's been talking about those in the church that were basically, let's face it, being lazy biddies bodies, and then he reminds his readers, hey, hey don't, don't grow weary in what's doing good now just because you see that going on. So I really think what he is saying right here is that even though there may be other Christians around you that are not doing what they should be doing to spread the gospel or minister to others, don't let that affect the good things you're doing. And I, I, I get it. You know, when we see others taking advantage of, uh, of Christian generosity or, or when we see other Christians doing the same, you know, we can get discouraged, upset, maybe even angry. Don't give in to that. You know, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, Paul writes, And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. So it goes back to what we looked at in the first several verses today, and that is the Lord's having that confidence in you that will make you able to do the things in his word. And one other thing here, too, and that is judging how much or how little you may think you see a Christian doing for the Lord. Be careful of that. You know what you should be concerned about? how much or how little you're doing. You know, I know there are many who quietly go about doing things for the kingdom that others may not see or ever know about because why? Because they're doing those things unto the Lord. They're not doing it for man's recognition. So again, be concerned what you're doing, how much or how little. You know, Romans chapter uh, 14 
in verse 4, Paul writes, Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. So let's read Paul's last two verses on this topic before we close with Paul's benediction in this letter. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 14, Paul writes, And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person, and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. So Paul again addresses our responsibility to withdraw from those Christians that do not obey God's commands and willfully walk in disobedience. You know, I read an interesting commentary on this verse, and, and this commentary makes the case that this instruction in verse 14 is for each brother or sister to do individually. No mention here is made of a public identification disciplined by the church itself, even though there are times when that may be necessary and to address scripturally. But here it seems to be on an individual to individual basis with discretion. If that is the case, it makes me think of something a mature believer told me once. He said, praise in public, rebuke in private. And I think that attitude of being compassionate while correcting our brothers and sisters is so well put by Paul in verse 15. He writes, yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. There should be no one in this room that sees an enemy in each other, but sees a brother or a sister. The kind of church discipline that Paul wrote about today is not the final rejection of the one needing correction. You know, let's face it. People have bad days. If we were to toss everyone out of the church because they had a bad day, this place would be empty. What Paul is talking about is an ongoing disobedience to the word of God that needs to be addressed. And even while an unrepentant pattern of disobedience to be dealt with decisively is to be continually kept in mind that the one with whom you are dealing with is a brother or a sister in the Lord, so all further warnings about their sin is to be done clearly and with a brotherly attitude in love. I want to share this with you before we conclude our reading in 2 Thessalonians. Bray's going to come up to lead us in worship today at the end here. And I want to close with some of Paul's words actually from the epistle, but I want to share this with you. Whether you like it or not, we're all going to be living together in eternity. Face it. Some of you might be roommates or bunkmates. Okay? <laughs> Eternity is a long time. Let's get prepared to do that now. And love our brothers and sisters now. In this lifetime. You know, the last thing I'd want to happen in heaven, and I don't think this can even happen, but think about this. You're in heaven. Here's that brother or sister you didn't really get along with. You're kind of like an awkward greeting. Oh, hey, you were going to be here. You know? <laughs> maybe a brother or sister that you didn't get along with, or maybe you didn't have patience with. Or maybe you get to have it, you just try to avoid it, like eye contact, like you'll do this, like, oh, I don't see him. I don't think it works that way. Instead, let's take Paul's words to heart now from verse 5 in today's reading, the title of today's message. Now may the Lord direct your hearts, clear out your hearts of all that junk into the love of God and onto the patience of Christ. Let's close with Paul's words from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. And then we'll worship the Lord. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write. Paul wanted them to know this was him speaking. And he closes with this. This is our closing prayer for today. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. 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 Let's worship the Lord in song. Amen. Amen.